Uh, my name is Todd Beers. All right. And what are you doing right now in Rochester? What you got right now? I'm uh, painting, uh, paintings, and then writing, and doing a little teaching. Okay. And when did you? Um, how long have you been what you would call a poet? Like when did you start to say, "I'm a poet"? And I'm a poet. That's what I am. Um. I think people started referring to me as a poet um, in maybe 85, 84, something like that, the 80s. Okay. And were you from Rochester? Did you start out here? Yes. You did? You're from Rochester originally? I'm from Wayne County. Okay. Right. A lot of snow in Wayne County. Uh, pardon? A lot of snow in Wayne County. <laughs> There's a lot of snow in Wayne County. Um, how did you meet Jim Cohn? How did you guys? start out together? Um, I guess I met him at a poetry reading. And, um, Jesus, Jim Cohn. Well, he had Action Magazine. Um, I was affiliated with Writers and Books. He was affiliated with it. Um, and he, um, I guess he's my publisher. <laughs> I could think of him as my publisher. He published some uh, little poems of mine, and uh, it gave me a lot of, um, he took me seriously, you know, as a poet. And um, that really didn't quite happen before that time. So I guess I, um, he really opened me up a lot and gave me um, hope, you know, like he did a lot of people back then, I think. He, and he took his poetry, poetry in general, very seriously. I think I remember Jim saying, um, I love this quote, but poetry has been my mo most faithful bride. And ain't that the truth? <laughs> That's cool. That was his quote? That was his quote. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. How did you guys come to uh, create the Painted Rope series? And why was it called? Um, a few of us did something at uh, the old Snake Sisters on uh, South Avenue, the 12 and a half cent poetry series. And at that time, there wasn't all these open mics, you know. I think there was something at Writers and Books, but if you went outside of Writers and Books, there was, we were it, you know. There was like 10 or 12 of us. And, um... I think maybe we asked him to read there, he found out about it, and then um, we decided just to do something together. And um, I was doing these constructions in the basement, and I was um, framing whatever I was doing with rope, and I was painting it. Um, <laughs> like four o'clock in the morning, there's Todd on his knees in the basement painting these strings and ropes like purple with my hands, you know? And then we were talking. I just spilled my coffee. Um, we were talking. He said, what, 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 what could be a name for the um, poetry reading? And um, I said, how about painted rope? I like the uh, alliteration, the P. And he said, okay. He was pretty easy to work with, you know? And he let things just kind of happen. What was the original intention of the series? Son of a bitch. No, no, Sorry about that. <laughs> Pardon? What was the original intention of creating this series? Particular kinds of writers or? Well, he was involved with NTID. And um, uh, so he incorporated uh, the, some, some deaf poetry, which I wasn't aware of at the time, and um, so we, um, we uh, put the two together and uh, created something that um, I've never, I never saw before, and it um, was a uh, big influence on my work, um, being experienced, uh, being exposed to the uh, deaf poets. I'm going to ask you in a minute about the influences on your work, but um, first of all, you had never been exposed to sign language or deaf people before this time? Not 
at all. Not at all. Not at all. I didn't only I don't even think I saw sign language at that time, you know. Maybe with Jim talking to somebody and moving his hands and it was like what the hell is he doing? You know, it was I was it was t totally different language for me. Mm -hmm. But I, I I loved the uh the dance of it all. You know. There seemed to be a de dance quality to it. Mm -hmm. Did you before you saw deaf people doing the poetry, did you have an interpreter work with you? Was your first experience with the whole translation thing working with an interpreter? Or did you see some deaf poetry stuff in the Yeah, I, I think I was exposed to maybe Peter and um, Kenny um, doing some stuff mm -hmm. together. And you had mentioned a couple minutes And ago. I thought it was cool that, like, I could... Um, like Kenny, it was cool that Kenny was there for me as a hearing person. So it kind of, you know, it was kind of, I enjoyed, you know, it kind of flipped the switch on the whole thing. So I could be, um, it was like I was the one that couldn't hear in a way, you know. And in a way I wasn't. I was the one that couldn't hear. Um, so that was nice of Kenny. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> I thought he did that for me, and he um, did. Talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about the whole process of working with, of watching interpreters on stage and then working with interpreters yourself. Um, well, working with them made me um, really think about what I was doing and what I... Um, Maybe not my intent, because I think a poem um, is smarter than the poet. Um, so it made me um, um, realize what the poem was, was trying to say to me. And I never really um, took it to that level before. Um, so it, it was an education for me, I think, working with an interpreter. Um, and it was you I worked with, and you would ask me a question, and um, I maybe uh, an angle that I never even thought of before, because my intent was to you know create an image, um, and I might leave it at that, but then the image uh, would um, either uh, obviously symbolize something maybe that I didn't understand or was. Um, you know, what was the uh, image saying, or what was the uh, friction between these two images, perhaps? So it, uh, it made me go deeper with my own work, I think. Or with the, um, the magic of art, it made me um, see it, perhaps, uh, better, I think. Oh, I know. I know that. And uh, watching the work was... Um, you know, the, the William Carlos Williams line, um, in things, not in ideas, show, don't tell. And that's where hearing poets uh, miss, miss the boat. You know, it's not about the thought. It's, it's about the, um, the experience, I, I think, for me at least. So if it, when, it, when a poem moves me, I, I have an experience with it. Uh, a thought doesn't really move me so much, but if I can see it or hear it, or it, it, it um, evokes some of my senses, then there's an experience there. And um, the uh, a deaf poet, in a way, has an advantage because you have to um, go to the image. Um, so it's it's kind of like um, you know when I, I worked with um, kids in the hospital, some of them were chronically ill, some of them were going to die. We didn't have to deal with all that bullshit in between. Well, they were already there, so we were there. We we got it already, you know. I didn't have to teach them about things, and a, and a deaf poet, um, they're already there as well because they have to go to the image. They have to know what they're saying. There's no, um, I mean, there can be amb ambiguity 
where there's two things being said, or you could take things, you know, on this level or on this level, um, but they have to they have to go to the image. They have to know what they're doing in, in a way. Um, it's it's a it's a lot more than um, an idea. It's a heck of a lot more than an idea. And I would um, I wouldn't listen to a poet speaking. I would always look at the interpreter when I was in the audience. Um, it allowed me to see the poem better. It, it was almost I could hear the poem, but they interpreted it for me in a way and gave it more substance. And the poem began, it, the poem danced, you know, through the interpreter, which was um, uh, an experience for me. They were very, very moving for me. From an interpreter point of view, um, one interesting thing that we went through was that when we worked with you guys, we, it wasn't just the cerebral kind of, all right, I'm translating, I have to put it out in this language. It was like putting on your poetry like it was clothes because we had to embody it. And so sometimes mm. I would have experiences where I would interpret somebody's stuff and I wouldn't feel that I really got it. You know, I didn't really get, I'm not that person. I knew how to make mm. an image to convey to the deaf people, but I wouldn't really get it, but I would feel it because I wore it. Mm. And I know that uh, your stuff was like that for me and Jim's was a lot like that for me, that his stuff was so multi-layered, images, 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 and I wouldn't always understand. He liked to work like Sergei Eisenstein, you know, montage, montage, and that the overall things would get you after this huge bombardment of stuff. So I wouldn't hmm. understand sometimes why he would put these things all together, but I would convey it and do it pretty, I would work my ass off and get as, you know, do it as well as I could, put it out there for them to feel what they would feel from it. But I would have felt like I went through World War III, I, whatever the feeling was he was trying to get, oh. I didn't necessarily get the point of it, but the feeling of it was coursing through my body like, Wearing the cloak and then taking it off. So That's beautiful. So from our point of view, I, you know, I wore your great old. You clothes. ate it. I mean, you, <laughs> you. Uh, how brave! How brave an interpreter is, and to have my poetry worn by someone is what an honor that was for me, especially as a young poet, or as, even as just as a young man. To have someone take my art that seriously, and to um, experience it, and and I must say that um, the deaf audience took to my work more than um, a hearing audience. A hearing a hearing audience can just be there without being there. The deaf audience is there. Every everything there if if they're looking, they got it. So they they um they have to go to the um deeper meaning of the poem. They have to go to the heart. You, they can't just kind of let it go in one ear and out the other, as they say, you know. Um, so the the whole deaf culture, um, without me knowing, um, I know this is boring. It's about I, maybe that's about all I know. Um, but they really influenced me a lot, and um, probably influenced me as a painter as well, you know, a bit, I think, if I think about it. How did they influence, how did knowing that deaf people were getting, first of all, so after you would perform, deaf, you would have conversations with deaf people about your work? Yeah, and just how they reacted. I could read, tell that they were into the work. Um, they got it the way I got it. And, and um, they let me know that um, they reassured me that I got it. They reassured me that I um, um, was doing, I, I was actually doing something, you know? And um, the attention, the attention to the art. It wasn't um, lip service, how um, poetry can be sometimes, you know? It was, um, they, they, they internally, internally got it. 
you know? But I was always after the image myself. And um, I think a lot of hearing poets like ideas, you know, go back to that line. And um, I don't think that's art. I don't think that's poetry. And um, yeah, they would come up and talk to me a bit. Did you feel that you said it influenced your, your artwork as well as your poetry? Did you intentionally become much more, um, you know, in terms of images, uh, stronger images in your, in your poetry and leave maybe the verbiage a bit more simple? Or how did, how did it have an effect on you? On the, on the poetry? Oh, um, just, um, th I think it's mostly the attention, the, the, the attention they gave to the image, and, um, and let me think about it for a minute, how did it? I don't know. How did it? How did it really? How did it really, really do it? I think being understood. You know, I think being understood. I, I write, I think I write to connect, um, you know, that internal world with my outer world. And I really think um, it allows the art allows me to feel like I'm actually here and, and as whole as I could be. And for that to be appreciated, for that to be understood, is, 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 is love, is life. So, I mean, it, it goes beyond the art. I mean, what's the difference, though? Um, and for me to be there or here and to have them really paying attention and appreciating that I'm there as a person, you know, um, is, a, is a gift, is a gift. And we're not here that long. And um, I think deaf people might be forced to understand that better in an abstract way, in a roundabout way. And it's more direct. It's more direct. There's, there's, there's no manipulating. Well, there's manipulation. I guess art is manipulation to some extent. Um, but there is truth. It's manipulation, but it's truth, you know, I think. So it's, it's not so much influenced me as a, um, what direction to go, but it influenced me to um, keep being myself and um, and follow it, you know, and to keep following it. And it's the attention, it's, it's the intent, it's the, att the attention, which is, um, that gives life. The detail, right? Everything's in the detail. Um, even God, they say. And then that's what art is about, is the detail. The, 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 the speck. Hmm. <laughs> Leonard Cohen about that speck of dust that you get to see once in a while in the, in the light. It's all there, you know? And um, they just reaffirmed it for me, I think. That sounds like an amazing connection, like a really, it was so it sort of sounds like a, almost like a seminal time for you to no doubt. come into that group, as well as, a, as well as a very active hearing poet community that was here in Rochester, for from the size, there was so much going on, and uh, your series, was the Pain and Rope one also the same one where there were like three or four a night and there were a whole bunch of folks? Right. Sometimes there'd be three or four and there were tons of us interpreters who were working with several, you know, uh, 
It was some time, wasn't it? It, it was so It was fun. wild. There's nothing like it now, you know? Um, everything's just gotten um, split and, you know, um, and I, you know, I used to think, well, I'm just reminiscing about my own life and how great it was, but I mean, it was freaking happening. You know, it really was. Um, and we took it seriously. And we meant it, you know? I mean, really. Um, it's what we did. And um, it was an education. And there, there were, there were, um, you know, we brought people in from out of town and um, everything was interpreted. I'll never forget for Jim Cohn interpreting, um, and we had music too. Um, I remember Jim Cohn interpreting a rock song once. It, I've never been so frightened in my life. I've never seen anything like that. The music was, uh, it was hard, some kind of hardcore stuff. And then it goes back, it, it just goes back to um, feeling it, n having to feel it in here. Because how Jim was interpreting it, he was interpreting it like, I've never seen anything like it. I just went right in me watching him, you know? Frightening. If it's frightening, it's frightening. If it's, if it's love, it's love. If it's bittersweet, it's bittersweet. There's no denying it when it's interpreted. It, it, just the word interp interpreted is interesting to me, you know? Interpreted. Everything should be interpreted, shouldn't it? A little bit? Or, or not at all, maybe. Or not at all. But no, yes, interpret everything. Interpret nothing. I don't know. We are. And you know, we would bring in like someone like it, uh, is it uh, Elaine, Eileen Miles? Or uh, Bernadette Mayer, Meyer, Mayer? Some, we would bring in um, pretty uh, big poets who, who had a career already going on. And um, I don't think they were exposed to what we were doing. I mean, it, it was an education for people that came in from out of town as well, that already were well on their way, you know, with careers probably more advanced than ours, you know? at the time. It uh, opened up a lot of, it, o it just opened up a lot of things for people. I remember um, the, 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 the poet about the, uh, the space shuttle. And 20 years ago, uh, it, 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 it stuck with me because it was experienced. I could see it in this, uh, you mentioned it earlier before the interview where the space shuttle came up and then it exploded and made him think of Kennedy being shot and then the tears came down. And maybe hearing people are at a disadvantage because that's that's hard to um words are so limiting you know i'm up here struggling my ass off trying to get it right you know when we're talking before the camera it's just like you know so easy but now it's like oh my god um they're so limiting trying to communicate with somebody what you really want to say and to, and to, you know this and then Kennedy, and then coming down to, to, to say that, is, it's real hard to make it as beautiful as that. With the right words, with the sound, you know, poetry is so complex. Um, so I never thought of that until talking to you, that maybe us um, hearing people are at a disadvantage. In, man, in, 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 in many ways, maybe, I think. I think maybe we're the deaf people. I really do. Um, I really do. I really do. Although I would miss my music, hearing music, but maybe that's, I don't know. You get the music, though. Um, Wendy talked about, I interviewed Wendy Wells. Uh, and she mentioned. Good old Wendy. Wendy was great, and she mentioned. Uh, 
that each culture and each language has their poetry has the different wonderful merits that are endemic to that particular language that it can only do because of the way it is. And that sign language, one of the things that she said she would just give her teeth for, is its ability to transformations and morph images into each other. And that whole visual thing that, you know, movie angles and all that stuff that you can do that, you know, with words, it'll take eight million words to describe this image that somebody can do in four signs. Ah. Uh. see like a picture in front of you. And that that's the thing that sign language has that, you know, maybe it doesn't have 150 synonyms for, you know, rug, you know, gray rug on floor dirty or something, you know, but, but what it does have is just, you know, putting the image out with different little subtle things so that you'll just get it. You don't need all those. It's so direct it. and it goes right in you. Yeah. There's less decoration to, to, to the, um, to get to the center of it all, I think. It's a picture's worth a thousand words, you know? And maybe that's why, maybe it's why he paints, you know? You turn to painting more almost, because it is a little more direct, even though it might be more complex of what's being said, but it, it's more layered, you know? That's interesting to me. Good old Wendy. Do you remember, um, <coughs> you mentioned Patrick Gray with the space shuttle poem. Do you remember any other of the deaf poets that you saw? I'm sure you had a lot of exposure to Peter and Kenny, and you remember Debbie a little bit. Do you remember you, Debbie a bit, yeah. It, I'm sure it's hard to, without having seen their work in a long time, do you remember any sort of sense you had of what you saw that was different about each of them, or like hit you a certain way about their styles, or was that just too, you know, it's too hazy? Oh, I, I remember this other cat, too. Um, he's still around. I saw him the other day at the market. Um, Eddie. Eddie Slate. I remember Eddie. Coming in this afternoon. Well, I, you know, I think it's hard to, um, as a deaf poet, it, it's probably hard to um, copy, cop a style. You know, um, you kind of have to be who you are. I mean, it's your body. You know, the body's the poem. I mean, how cool is that and um, how do you copy someone else's body and I guess people are doing it these days but I'm not recommending it um, everybody wasn't you know it's the individual has to come out if you're if you're even uh, if you're who you are I, your body is who you know it's not who you are but it's that's representing who you are I guess and you can't fake that and that's uh, kind of neat kind of neat words you know we can us hearing poets can copy styles and whatnot and I guess you can I'm sure they're influenced by each other I'm sure uh, Kenny um, blew the uh, lid up open for uh, people to even do this but uh, you can't copy uh, Peter and Peter you know how do you copy Peter you can't I don't think so there was a um, Maybe there's a, a more of a respect for the individual, in a way, is, um, because you're kind of forced into that, it seems, maybe. Now, you're making me think a lot, Miriam. So no, that's good. <laughs> it's good. You have to, I'll have answers for you in a week. <laughs> bring you back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember going to Vermont? Didn't you go to the Bacalli Festival at one time when Peter was there, and you guys spent the whole time writing on a piece of wood? You took the piece of wood home with your whole conversation from the whole weekend? Maybe. I wonder if you still had that piece of wood. That's where you guys were back and forth for about, like, two to every time I came out to the campfire. You came. You Dang, I remember that. Okay, you yeah. Were, yeah. You and Peg came to that. Really Isn't that full? Yeah, yeah, road, yeah. Road, yeah. Road, and you took, I remember you taking this piece of wood and, like, putting it in your car. Oh, <laughs> man, I wish I had that now. I, I um, love to see that. <laughs> well, Peter is, you know, Peter was, is amazing. I remember Peter, um, he was like a block away from me. His back was to me, and I yelled at him, because I forget Peter's deaf, you know, I just forget that I can hear one of the two. He, he turned around, you know? It was the weirdest thing. He just turned around as soon as I yelled at him. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's in touch with something. 
And, and, and uh, I mean, he could read lips so well, but I never, talking to him was like the most natural thing in the world and understanding him for me was the most un amazing thing in the world, you know? Um, just so direct. And there's an emotional level, you know, with the deaf poetry too, which we kind of talked about abstractly maybe, where it just, you got to be there. You got to be there to, t you know? You have to be there. Or don't show up, you know? What's the point? Did you, ever, Debbie, did you ever meet her or talk to her? Um, I, not too much. I think she was, uh, not, not a lot. I know she was a, a major player in all. And, um, I mean, I've always respected Debbie, but um, I don't really remember remember a lot about her. I think she was, uh, um, I don't know. Okay. Well, once she and Penny broke up, she was pretty much, I mean, she was still doing stuff around here and there, but she wasn't much. Concerned. Yeah, and I and think, she moved away. Mm -hmm. and I think she was away when we started Painted Rope, maybe, or maybe she was, was she still around? Oh, yeah, very much part of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, I don't remember well, too much. Pardon? What is poetry? What is it? What is it? What is this? What is poetry? Well, it's the, uh, I don't like to rev revert to um, quotes, but uh, I think Olson, Charles Olson said it's the only, um, or maybe it was saying art, but same thing. Uh, Charles Olson said, uh, art is the um, only t twin life has. I kind of like that. Um. It's, a, it's a dance. It's another language. It truly is another language. It's not the... Um, it might be a twin, but it's it's not it's not the experience. Um, it's not the experience that I'm not just taking a picture of what happened. I think a good poem. Um, um, oh, perhaps. Perhaps it makes visible what's invisible. Can you say that starting with poetry makes, you know, start that with poetry makes invisible? I think poetry makes visible what's invisible. It um, unrepresses, it undenies, it, um, it'll, it, it, it says it's okay to laugh or cry or fuck or whatever, you know, it, it's real, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's truth, it's truth, I think, a deeper truth than, like, you know, my hat's brown, that there's a truth involved to it that we don't always get to, you know. Without it, I, 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 I don't know if I would be here. Well, I wouldn't be here, but I don't know if I'd be here, you know. Yeah. I'm wiped. <laughs> well, that's... That was harder than I thought. That's good. Thank you so much. I think your hat is poetic, so, I mean... My hat? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it, it would have been better if it would just pretend, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Camera's spooking. Is it cold? No, it's still cold. Is it cold? I'm always cold. Cool. So it was great. Cool. Oh, so you didn't feel the camera spooked you? No, but it just, you know, talking beforehand, you know, things come out That's easier. I was trying to hold that. Yeah. yeah. I realized that we were going to shoot the web before, and I, did, I made this mistake a few weeks or a month ago with, a, with somebody... 
We had this incredible, we had a, ha a half hour conversation and it was rich and wonderful. We came in and he had absolutely hardly anything left. He did a great job, but later he said, I don't feel good about this. I felt like I didn't do what you needed. We talked about it all before. I said, I think I led you back enough to what I remember you said. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was like, oh, I'm going to sit up. It was like, don't talk, not yet, not yet, not yet. Come on, not yet. <laughs> but it's just like talking, I could, you know, say so much. And then. My name is Eddie Swayze. I know I am so well, but I'm using my voice at the same time because I'm being more connected to people too. Their accessibility also, fair enough. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been writing poetry in English writing during high school years in the 80s. Maybe my well, high school was in Horsehead High School near Elmira area in New York. Um, during that time, the punk movement was going on, and I discovered Patti Smith, and I saw her writing. I was fascinated with her way of playing with words, and I started experimenting my own and using some word and, you know, that I write, wrote poem for a while. Then when I got to NTID in 1983, I discovered Jim Cohen, Peter Cook, Deborah Ray all that. But I didn't think about for myself as translating poetry to, you know, English to ASL. I didn't think about that. Only signing a song. I've been doing this since 12 years old, signing a song. When I met Jim Cohen and asked him to me, I'm interested in doing ASL poetry. I was like, ooh, I never thought of that. Well, let me try it. So I went to Jazz Fairy the first time in 1983, 84. I don't remember. But, and that's how I got into ASL poetry. It's from Jim Cohen. He was my teacher in the class back then homework writing, homework assignment. He knew it was poetic, so he asked me if I'm a poet. So yeah, he recognized the kind of writing. Even my writing English was not so good at that time compared to now, but he noticed this poetic kind of writing. So he asked me, that's the other one poet he thought about performing. Yeah, so I've seen Peter Cook perform and all that, but he will. Okay, I'll give it a try. So ever since. And I wrote, yeah, and then really signing as a poet, it didn't cross my mind, really. I was just signing a song mostly at that time. Well, I signed a song with the music, English or not really. I thought about ASL, maybe PSC, depend on the, the lyrics. I don't remember it's <laughs> wrong. No. I don't remember. Well, I did write first because I wrote it for a long time. And I took some of the poem that I wrote and translated in ASL. Uh, when I remember, I don't remember the name of the poem. I think it's because the night, I think that was Patty Smith poem. And that was my first one. I had it with me when I was in TID. And Jim would act, I said, oh, this is small, it's a good start, not a long poem, not complicated. So I translated to ASL when I did that. Um, I still do some time English written translating in ASL, sometimes not at all. Back for it really depends on how the creative process goes. When you first started poetry, did you feel did you feel um, how do I let go of the words? How do I use the English? Was it hard for you? Awkward? It was hard at the beginning and and I remember performed the before rookie night or somewhere there before or after, I don't know, taking Peter Cook workshops and stuff. I remember Peter Cook challenged me, he said, don't look up the words, think of the English words, try and say all the pictures. I was like, <laughs> and it was a challenge. So now I'm much better than compared to, but yeah, I remember there was a challenge. There was a challenge. So you work now? Do you tend to do ASL? Well, I still write. I still enjoy writing. I love playing with the words in the English format. I love doing this. I don't have you know, but I do love ASL also. Sometimes, some poem I try to show ASL, sometimes it's just ASL, ASL from scratch. And same with theater to script writing, I just put ASL to, you know, English Shakespeare to ASL, which is a challenge, and I did it for Tempest back in 1989, which was the first theatrical performance I was involved with. I was always a performing artist. So the man David pulled me into <laughs> Tempest, and I'm like, okay, I don't know, Shakespeare. I thank God I have Peter Haggerty, who's a brilliant English teacher. I know Shakespeare, and I helped me. That helped. 
helped a lot. So, so I still do. I'm doing Cinderella now. It's a small production. It's a twist of Cinderella, and the description I have to look at it translating as well. So it's really Japan. And some of the script I see that I saw in Cinderella, the English wrote it. Like, I don't need that. I know the concept. It depends back and forth. It's bilingual and very bilingual. Yeah. Yeah, I can be about Lori Anderson, a multimedia performing artist. She influenced me a lot because, of course, she's poetic, she played with the words. But also, ever since I was a kid, I always thought sci fi thing or high tech um, imageries and, um, you know, cybernetic, punky look. And Lori Anderson has a lot of that in her multimedia thing with the video behind her, the huge video animation for work, vocal recording, changed the male voice for vocoder technology, and, and violin with. Um, binary coded tape. She played it, spoke itself. They listen, 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 things like that. I was thinking about, wow, this is so cool. And she produced me as one example. Now, poetry, I've poetry, I've done electronic music, I've done a little bit, but mostly one is using Bjork, one work, Pluto. The name is a very, very short and fast and very mechanical techno work. And I thought, wow, I guess it's almost like Lorianne's concept a little bit. It's using the bike, red light, blinking red light in the back of the bike for night protection. And the biker is right, blinking red light, two of them in my hand, and move along the music. Well, I'm not signing a song, I put it down on my sign. I also had a classes, a battery run, battery run classes, light, and move, very robotic looking. And people loved that, and I did. I did that recently, a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of months ago, for one small group of students. But I also did it back in the 1990s for ASL Cafe at Commons Cafe, and it was mostly Japanese student from transfer, transfer, no, visitor Japanese student. They don't know JSL. They didn't know ASL. When I did Bjork, they knew Bjork. It's very popular in Japan. And when I did that, they they could take me like crazy. This one woman would just dance like nuts. It was like. Wow, that is really cool. So, Lori Anderson flew me the idea of using technology, even though mine works more simple and cheaper compared to her equipment. I mean, I don't, I'm not rich like her, her world, which I love to, but um, but I use the idea of what I can afford and make it more interesting. So, I think you might need to contact someone involved in the ASL Cafe back then, and it was David Drum, and he moved to California. I don't know if you can contact them or Della Gorelick might have some videos to check. She has, I think I heard that she had the video of me doing Patty Smith, People Have the Power. And a very phenomenal video. I was told I didn't see it. But that was back in the 90s, the ASL Cafe. I don't know, so I have to check. Yeah. I'm sure the hard deaf would not come to the idea of having a hard of hearing person. I am hard of hearing, I call myself hard of hearing really, but I don't mind people calling me deaf. It doesn't bother me at all because I am part of the deaf culture anyway. I'm really in deaf culture all the time since I never let go of that. I accept myself really well. It's just that my hearing ability with a hearing aid on just seems to enable me to be hard of hearing. It's just the capability of technology today. The future, who knows? But Really, right now, I'm coming so hard to hear. Without hearing it, I'm gone pretty much. <laughs> Without hearing anything, really. So I really depend on a lot. So I'm coming so hard to hear. Well, recording to, according to signing a song, I mean, music, music. Um, the reality is that music was has been a part of my life since I was a kid. It has not changed, and and the hearing aid itself, 
those two unis, the much more sophisticated than before that picked up high frequency and so much better than I'm able to play guitar and electronic music and electric guitar. But yet, that doesn't mean that I'm able to sing with the guitar well. I don't sing well enough to match the keys. I know that. So I just play guitar and electronic music for fun. I don't expect to be famous and successful with that because I don't have that. I just realistic to myself that I'm out there. But I still enjoy electronic music in a simple way as possible that I know I can understand how to do it and use my poem along with electronic music using GarageBand software and iMac, which is the only thing I have. And I can afford it's already there. I can't afford to buy Pro Play and all that stuff that Laurie or Moby have. I mean, but what I have is what I have. So I used and I created electronic music soundscape. It may not be a perfect musical correctness or roots or whatever. It may not be perfect. And that's fine. I just want the beats and then the side is background. Background to go my poetry is good enough. So I enjoy that. So hearing people tend to enjoy that. Seeing electronic music and hearing the words and seeing the movement of a hand, the body language of a picture. I really enjoy that. I've seen that in writer's books and Just Poet Organization, which I'm supposed to do the workshop presenting that, two or three of my work, at St. John Fisher College on February, February of next year. Yeah. And um, so if enough people don't like it, I can understand if they, they couldn't get the music and why would I do it? Well, I just love the sound, especially high frequency sound, electronic sound on synthesizer things and um, spacey sound. I love soundscape, spacey, new age, and that's why I love Bjork and techno music and Laurie Anderson. It's just have a weird beep sound. I just love it. Gary Newman, for example, British electronic mix. So I don't remember. I'm sure there are. Well, I've seen some hardy party deaf people that do it, they're like, especially with lights, and this is the cool and um, unusual thing, and they would be fascinated. may not necessarily mean they like the music, but they don't hear it, but they like the visual. The hearing person would like my work, but they didn't know that the reality is not a perfect music, it's not. They get both. They get the but well, the deaf people may not make music if they don't hear high frequency at all. They may feel a beat and stuff. I did that with a drama club, um, drama club here, and they get the beat and they enjoy it, but they don't know what music is in. I mean, some may not. I'm not saying all of them. There are a lot of deaf people have a hearing ability. They're a different level they can pick up. I remember one deaf student from drama club. They like my electronic music. They like the sweet sound. He's able to pick up high frequency. He's hard to hear. And had pick up my breathing, you hear sweet sound of synthesizers. They're like, ooh, that's interesting. So it really depends on the individual and the level of the hearing ability they like it or not. Really, it's up to them, really. I, I'm not striving to be a top 40 musician. No. A pop, no. Oh, yeah, I've done a lot of those, yes. I have a lot of poems that have nothing to do with electronic music. Sometimes both back and forth, sometimes separate. Um, like Cyborg Drag Queen, the poem that just got published in Eyes of Desire, a deaf, hard of hearing, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender writers. Um, that was English written, translating itself. I have electronic music that, but I have not used it to perform it in the audience. I was not satisfied with it. So I have performed that Cyborg Drag Queen poem with no voice and just pure ASL storytelling, sci-fi setup of futuristic New York City of a drag queen or really an android and doing things with the Cochrane Planet controversy issue, so. Performing arts, I don't know. Good question, I have a lot of that. Is poetry performing arts? Well, you know, like Laurie Anderson had done, she used poetry or writing that she did for music it's called performing arts. I could say is my performing art. The only difference is that she does a sign, I do. 
Oh, she's not. She knows the ASL. She knows she's studying linguistic stuff. With Lori Ames has done that for PhD for music and linguistics. She knows some of that, but she's not fluent in ASL, of course, not in our first language. She didn't really get into interpreting anything like you did. So, I'm more using hand more than she's just a voice, like both words, that voice. I don't know. Yes, in a way, yeah, my cyborg drag queen has a poetic form of writing in there, but it's more of a ballad. It's a story. It's a story. It, it sets up the time. We are seeing the future of superconduct cars and all that stuff. But it also has poetic words in it, which I in the cell. And it also has a political statement at the end of the bunch. So, Poetry, it was just really meant to be poetry alone. It'd be poetry, we consider poems. When it was written in a ballad or a long verse, it is a little story set up. It can be different, yeah. Because poetry in ASL is just mostly um, playing with words. It doesn't have a, doesn't really often set up a time, day, and conflict resolution like the story and the story that has conflict was right acquisition thing you know and I learned it. literature I taught literature so I know what that is so there's the difference in poetry it has metaphors and all this stuff stories stories too but you know, only focus on the time when we are and the acquisition phenomenal in the middle and escalation and conflict resolution and <laughs> right, right, something like that, yeah. That's the new thing. Go, I got actually excited. It's like, keep going, keep going. And, and I end up performing there sometimes. And I don't know, I was just a group, group of people who are serious poet, performing artists, actors, you know, and they are to network and be friends. I got to know Peter and Debbie and all that. And it was just a wonderful event with all the parties we had after the river crate. So, <laughs> well, I saw him around on campus that he was an instructor and lovely teacher interpreting and all that stuff. And um, and then when I registered one class, or writing or English class, whatever, I don't remember, and it says TPA, I didn't know who, and it turned out to be him. And I met him and got to know him as he was an instructor. That's how I got pulled into Jasper because he asked me if I could perform because his notes my writing is very poetic. And he saw me attending and seeing Peter and he performed acme so that's how I met him. Oh. Well, did it take place in a Panera theater? Yes, I was, yeah, I went to see that. The group panel is a discussion with Ellen and West, and Ellen, Ellen May, and Peter Cook, Valley. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, that was great. It was wonderful. Yeah, I was the audience yeah, watching it. Well, the hearing poet is Patti Smith, of course. And I really like Patti Smith. I also like, um, I don't know, poem. I really like Rimbaud, Arthur Rimbaud, and Baudelaire, and um, Robert Blake. Uh, they really influenced Patti, and influenced me, makes sense. Uh, the style, the, the radical some poem at that time, Rimbaud is very radical at the time. And that's been his work, very experimental. Um, 
the style, the word, the plane of the words. It's a rock or a punk kind of avant-gardism. It's remote. It was very, very big for the to a lot of today. So, um, Death Poet, I love Peter Cook's work. I've seen him several times. Even a few years ago, he showed up at UFRs, and I, I still enjoy his work a lot. And I like Dad Rennie's work. I don't know what some work is like now, but back in the 80s, there's a lot of funny things, mostly political ones, just tough. To, some are real humorous, like I Rape Chocolate, which is, I'll never forget that poem. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, those two poems I really like. Clinton Valley, his style isn't my taste, really, but his movement, the location is the location, it's beautifully done. And um, I don't know, his idea of like the season, like the three seasons, I mean, four seasons, I just love that. Kind of, Plant Grable, of those who work, especially the, the cell explosion in Kennedy over there. Mm -hmm. I like the location up there down here, and it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, Ella, I, I like her work, it doesn't hit me much, really, but <laughs> one is very humorous about the classroom and the UFO. It's really funny, I forgot the name of that poem, but that's hilarious. As you go, oh, you have to look this space. I think that I like the sci fi act because that's very much like my slide more directly. I love sci fi stuff, the sci fi imagery, you know, cybernetic punk thing, you know, that's what I like. And I thought that was so funny and it was also spacey stuff. I don't know, I enjoy that. But the first is Peter Cook, Deborah Rennie, and I just love Impact Rainbow. Oh, and Debbie Rennie, I really like the I Rape Chocolate and the Kells, you know. Not, I boycott the yellow, oh, Bill, Bill Cook. So many of them I like, and I can't think of one I like, but. <laughs> um, favorite poem? Not really. I like uh, The Ballad of a Bad Boy by Patti Smith. Her writing changes change up to a boy, riding a car, and a wrecking car, and it's just really. Interesting. I gave that assignment to a student for literature class. I do love those. That's really funny. And um, it's a literary term about person changing who they really are, just if I can't remember the word, but, but of a literary word with that. But um, that was a nice poem. Um, and um, there's a lot of those poems in my pants, but I like I can't pick one. Really, I don't. Yeah. And I like Patty Smith. Um, it's really, she sung it, she spoke it in one of her songs in the beginning of the live concert in her Easter album. The I'm American artist and I have no guilt. I love that phrase. That's true. Should not be ashamed to be an artist. Be an artist. I'm an American artist and I have no guilt. I like that phrase. I don't I'm playing the past and future. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, well, during when I was taking art history, you know, as an undergraduate student, I was discovered Marcel Duchamp, Francis Picabia, futurist, surrealist, surrealism movement. They were focused on technology and available technology at that time. I mean, from not advanced now, not compared to now. I'm sure those artists would be flipped out to see what they see now. And I'm sure they would love it because they would not even do that, you know, at that time. There was no social computer at that time mm -hmm. in the 1920s, 1900. But they did a lot of cinematic experiment, experimentation with cin cin cinematic thing, cinema film, you know. Uh, Marcel Duchamp focused on found objects and put it all together and I, the artwork behind me is like that. It has plenty of glass, it painted on plenty of glass, computer generated image, print out on transparent paper, put it on a plenty of glass, see through, light go through it, dash, bolt and then drill, drill it into wood. The painting will all the, and computer generated image of the most smoke stack, if you don't notice well behind me, but it has smoke stack, with smoke coming out and all that stuff and no, so Marcel Duchamp did that with his, the, the Bachelor of the Bride and the, I can't remember, but it's a glass piece, my favorite piece of work. 
which I didn't see in real yet. I know it's a Philadelphia Museum, Philadelphia, Philadelphia Museum of Fine Art. I want to go there, but I like to, but that's the similar idea. That the artwork behind me is just part of this front close-up of plastic glass work. Which you can't tell it's plastic glass there behind me, but and it's a huge piece of work on my chain and lit up with black light behind. It was slight fanatic from Lori Anderson and Jim Pite, but also I mean, back historically, the futurist and Rosa Duchamp listening to that kind of work. I can just focus on deaf culture as a cultural plan issue. And I have one poem published seven years ago it's called Bone. It's about deafness, about bones, just the fragility of three bones and the cochlea problem and how it diminished the sound in the ocean waves and how micro soft it is and how beautiful it is. It's, I have one published and poem. I can send you that because I have saved my file. So I have several poems about the deaf issue, but just not so many because I'm so interested in other things, so interested in technology and science fiction thing and stuff like that, and political social issue. But I do have several deaf issues like Cyborg Drag Queen. They're a mix of technology, but I find it less deaf issue than the Coca Plan issue. You know. But uh, the other one is about the deafness only with just bones and no music, and no sci fi thing. It's just pure hands out. You know. In English, a little bit. Oh, not all the time. Once in a while. Uh, I do want to portray the problem that people face. Of course, some of my work do have a statement about that. So it's not, I don't have pounds in the poem about deafness only. I have other things that I'm fascinated with. What is poetry? <laughs> um, well, poetry is playing with words in an English setting. Um, you play with words and you come up with metaphors, similes, similes, all that stuff. Put it together, try to make um, aesthetic quality of poetry itself and how it can be presented in spoken, in spoken words. Or to make ASL, American Sign Language Poem, you can translate from English to ASL to try to make it beautiful ASL, or from scratch to ASL alone, instead of with a visual imagination in their head, which many deaf people do that, or hard people do that, which is fine, and can be pro approached in a performing arts way, using the hand, and the motion of the hand, and the facial by the body language, if not used by voice, is mostly focused on hand shape, the constant hand shape, location, a classifier, you know, ASL linguistic concept that could be used. But poetry is different than just sign ASL when you're having a conversation. Poetry in ASL, ASL poetry, it's just, you just perform it. It's just similar to how you perform in English phonetically. And you know, how it, like Patti Smith, play her voice with vocal elevation and emphasis and shout and do, and play with words. One thing in ASL that can be emphasized when you punch one hand shape or and just be operated in a way that's more creative than just spoken words or conversation in ASL in the hallway. It's a different approach. So poetry is playing with words necessarily. And poetry is playing with words, and playing with words, and playing with hand, but it has to play with imagery. And poetry has imagery, but it's English, so it's playing vocally, and it's playing with words. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Thank you